Have you ever felt strange, like something is just not quite right, but you can't explain why? Have you ever stepped into a room that seemed to exist on an entire different layer of reality, or have had an interaction with a person that the next moment just wasn't there? There are many stories online about people claiming to have accidentally stumbled into a different dimension, and though only for a short moment. It has left a lasting mark on them, questioning the very fabric of their reality. Hello and welcome back to Certainly Strange. This is the fourth episode of the second season of the podcast, and、um, this episode is a little bit different from the rest. I thought, isn't it just nice to switch it up every once in a while、uh, to see if you listeners will like it. And so that you don't really get bored of the format that I usually use. So what is so different from today's episode is that instead of doing my usual story and theories, I'm going to read people's accounts of some experiences they've had、uh, from Reddit. And the experiences that we're covering today are instances where people think that they have accidentally, for a short time, stepped into a different dimension. Now I do have to mention that, of course, I cannot fact check any of these stories, and though I usually love to do research to find out, you know, what is true and perhaps、uh, less true, I couldn't do that with these stories. And also, I'm not an expert on people's psychological well-beings or certain personal circumstances that can affect your experience of the world. So the people that have written these stories, they do claim that they, like, they weren't drunk or hadn't been drinking,、uh, that they didn't use drugs when they experienced this. So be free to take everything in this episode with a grain of salt, if you like. Uh, nevertheless, I think it will be very interesting and <laughs> certainly strange. <laughs> I do have had one of these experiences myself, and I will tell that later on in this episode. And that is the experience that I will, you know, share my theories on and elaborate on.、Uh, that being said, let's just get into it. Story number one, the drive-through, posted by Reddit user Ninja Nerd BGM. A couple of hours ago, I was in the midst of a coding frenzy when my stomach started rumbling constantly. I decided that my coding project can wait for a few minutes and that I needed to get some food. I live in the Western United States, so the nearest place is always a McDonald's. I picked myself up from the computer, threw a leash on my dog, and headed out. I loaded the dog in my car and turned the ignition. Outside, there was still a bit of light. The sun had just dipped behind the mountains in the horizon, and it was just dark enough to warrant headlights. As I'm winding my way out of my neighborhood, I started to notice that the street lamps kept going out as I passed under them, and then coming back on when I passed them. Which I thought was strange, but I chalked it up to coincidence, as I've had streetlights go out on me before. I eventually made it to one of the last turns to get out of the neighborhood, but as I pulled up to the stop sign, I felt a wave of something pour over me. I heard my dog whimper. I looked back at her, and she had ducked back into the middle of the back seat, tail between her legs, with her fur sticking straight out. It felt like I went through a thick sheet of static electricity, honestly, and I began hearing a loud feedback noise inside my head, and the world got blurry. This went on for a few seconds before it cleared up. My car had stalled during this time, so I turned the engine back on and made my way past the stop sign. When I pulled out into the main road. I immediately noticed that the streets were vastly different. 
they were the usual black, but they had a bright white iridescent color to them as well, lighting up the environment. The street lights that were usually on the medians on the road were gone as well, replaced by trees. The McDonald's was still right by my house. I could see the sign. It was a different building though. The building was much bigger than usual, but so far this is the least strange thing to happen on this drive. So I drove towards it, still very confused as to the sudden change. My dog in the back of my car seemed to acclimate to this change much better as she was back to sticking her head out of the window and sniffing the air. I pulled up to the only stoplight between me and my destination and the car in front of me was something I had never seen before. The logo on the back was a silver circle with what looked like a silver Sicilian eagle in the middle. On the eagle's chest was the letter G in the cursive font. The model of the car was Vapor. The license plate was the same as any other though. So I go through the light, still wondering what the hell happened when I reached the McDonald's. I get to the drive through menu, which is all LCD screens updating to show featured menu items and looping gifs of people smiling while they eat. My usual is still on the menu, though for two dollars more than I'm used to paying for it, so I order that. I pull up at the window with my credit card out and at the ready so I can pay. The worker opens the window and greets me. I greet him and hand him my card. He looks at it and then back at me and says, we don't accept that here. And then hands me a gadget that reminds me of my dad's blood pressure monitor. I guess I was supposed to put my finger in it, but I was so thrown off I just asked, uh, can I just pay with cash? Cash? I'm sure, I guess. So I hand him a $20 bill and he inspects it for longer than anyone should and then proceeds to give me my receipt without my change. When I asked him about the change, he looked at me with a very confused face and said, We don't have cash at this location, sir. We only can give cash vouchers. Okay. So I look at my receipt and lo and behold, the bottom of it says, Cash value, $11.26. Good enough for me, I guess. I pulled up to the next window. After waiting for a few minutes, the next worker opens up his window with my bag of food in his hand and a big smile on his face. He hands me the bag and I put the receipt in it out of habit. He then says to me, Oh right, I forgot your fries, can I have the bag back please? So I hand him the bag and a few seconds later he returns and says, I hope you have a great day. I made this great day. This went on for a few seconds. His face and body motions were moving and resetting like when you tilt a N64 game slightly out of console. I didn't have time to be terrified during this moment because as this happened, I felt a wave of electricity come over me again. Just like the last time I heard my dog whimper and when I looked back she was crouched in the back, her fur extended. And just like the last time, I heard a loud feedback noise in my head. My eyes took a second to adjust, but when the world came into focus I saw that I was in a parking lot. I recognised everything. This was the parking lot in which the McDonald's I'm used to is placed. And sure enough, the McDonald's was visible in my rearview mirror at its usual location. So I go through and buy food again. However, my $20 remains missing. Story 2. The Airplane. Posted by Reddit user Bissabutton. About a year ago, back when I was 19, my family and I went on a vacation in southern Thailand. My family consists of me, my dad, my mum and my older sister and we all enjoy warm weather and beaches a lot since we are from Scandinavia, which is usually really cold. Therefore we decided to go on a classic beach holiday. The beach was usually packed with tourists just like us and the day the event I'm about to explain was not any different. So, let me get to the actual event. 
We went to the beach relatively early, around 10am, because it was one of the last days of our stay and we wanted to take advantage of the bright sun before heading home a couple of days later. My dad and sister were out on the water chilling and my mom and I were watching our belongings on the shore. I started to hear a sort of rumbling noise, but it was so distant that I thought nothing of it. I noticed the sound closing in somewhat fast, and about a minute later my mum asked me if I notice it too, and if I have any idea what it might be. I respond with a shrug and lie back down. The rumbling started to sound more and more like an engine, and all of a sudden a Boeing 747 flew straight over us, probably around 200 or 300 metres above the beach out over the ocean. The whole beach noticed her and I could hear some gasps and a few screams from the other tourists and locals around me. This plane flies around one kilometre out over the ocean and starts ascending until it reaches a stall midair. It then starts falling towards the water and finally hits it, creating a big splash. Several boats approach the site at which the plane crashed shortly after rescue boats or something, I don't know, and my family and I curiously and anxiously watch as more and more boats arrive. So here's the crazy part. I clearly remember watching it on the news. My family and I talked about the incident over dinner and over the last days of our stay. We even spoke to some locals about it. Well, it left a scar on our otherwise amazing vacation. I gotta say, the flight back home was terrifying for obvious reasons, but I had no other choice but to sit through it if I wanted to get home. At home, we all went to our rooms to get a bit of sleep due to the jet lag. During dinner, we began to reflect on our vacation as we usually do after a trip, but none of my family members mentioned the accident. I then bring it up, but they don't remember it. I was very confused, but they insist that they didn't see this accident. It resulted in a small argument and I got pissed, thinking that my family was trying to mess with me. Later, I go to my room and check if there are any updates on the accident, any reason as to why the plane crashed, survivors, etc. But I find nothing. No news media had written about it and nothing came up if I googled it. I even researched some Thai news, but they hadn't written on it either. Basically, it was as if this accident never happened. I am 100% positive that it happened. And the thing that creeps me out the most is that my family and I all talked about the accident and all very clearly saw it firsthand. It bothers me so much that I, even a full year later, still think about it so much to the point that I have been diagnosed with insomnia. I am still very freaked out over it and I'm sure as hell never going back to that place. Story 3 The Road Posted by Reddit user Pacho95 About four years ago, I lived on this fairly small fly speck of a town. At the time, I had lived there for about 12 years, so I knew my way around. Our house was about a mile and a half away from the nearest neighbourhood. Our mum intentionally picked that house due to the lack of neighbours. It was tucked away on a back road, with a route surrounding it. Every now and again, I liked to take walks with my little brother, who at the time was 13. We decided to do just that. We headed up the road and decided to try and find a new path or a new clearing that we hadn't discovered yet, when we noticed something a little shocking. Just off the road that led almost directly to the neighbourhood, there was a brand new paved road. Every road in that part of town was a gravel road, so seeing an out-of-place paved road was pretty unusual. We stared at it for a while and came to the conclusion that it must have been made within the last few days, due to the modern but slow growth of the town. However, we had no explanation for how they did it so fast. We decided to explore it a bit. I remember as soon as we set food on the road, the air became noticeably colder by at least 5 degrees. 
The road itself was a black pavement, but no dividing lines. It was surrounded by some thick red trees that resembled redwoods. But they were too short and non-native to our state, which is southern Arkansas. We walked on the road for about three miles until we decided to head back to it becoming dark. When we got off the road, we felt the temperature go back up. My brother and I agreed to explore it further the next day. At roughly noon the following day, we set back to explore this place, only to discover that the entire road was now missing. When I say missing, I mean that the trees that were clear to make it had apparently grown back with no sign of the redwood-like trees. We even began to explore the woods even more, but only to find no sign that it ever existed. When we asked our parents about it, they said that they knew nothing about this new road being done near us. Before we go to our last story, which is my own experience, first a word from one of my friends over at the Boopot Network. Greetings friends. Do you have a taste for the unknown? Are your days plagued with thoughts of the strange and morbid? Has your bloodlust for knowledge of the most sadistic killers that has ever walked the earth ever been satisfied? If not, then I'm here to help. Welcome to the Nightcap, where nothing is taboo and the topics are always fresh. Join me by the fire on the first of every month for tales of terror and stories of the sadistic. Learn why your neighbor might be hiding a horrible secret or if that conspiracy theory you thought was false turned out to be real. Whatever your dark desire, I have what you need. You can find me on Spotify, Radio Public and Anchor with more ways to listen coming soon. Without further ado, be safe, stay curious. And now, back to your program. That was The Nightcap. If you are looking for a podcast to give you the bloody chills, you are on the right address at The Nightcap. Trust me. Go check them out on Spotify. But before you do, let me first tell you about my own experience, perhaps stepping into a different dimension. Some years back, my friend Lana and I decided that we would spend the summer travelling through Europe, visiting some of the big cities by train. Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, we've been there all. And we had decided that it was best to take as many night trains as possible, simply because they were cheaper and would spare us some time travelling. That is how we ended up taking the night train from Venice to Paris. I remember it very well, how we sat on the ground with our massive backpacks, watching as the train station got busy about a minute. I noticed how many families there were, and a lot of them were talking about going to Paris, as we were. It gave me a bit of a cosy feeling, thinking about how we were all going on that same trip with the same starting point and the same destination. Uh, It gives a sense of connectedness with strangers. Eventually, way behind schedule, the train arrived. Our seats were in the far back where all the beds were located. Those were more expensive, that's why more people chose for the normal seats. I don't say this to brag, it's just that spending several nights sleeping sitting upwards, you get a true appreciation for a normal, real bed. I still have the ticket in my mailbox. Our beds were located in carriage 85, places 64 and 66. It was the very last carriage of the train. We were not alone in our compartment. Although it was a very, very small compartment, there were six beds in it and besides ours, two other beds were occupied. I remember that one was occupied by a man called Victor, who was an Italian who worked for a French hotel, and we jokingly told us that he chose to work in Paris simply because he was named after a French writer. The other traveller was also an Italian, but he spoke very little English. From the very start, we were not alone, and I was not the only one to experience what we did. Lana and I started talking to Victor. The evening started off as the most pleasant train trip that we had had during our vacation. Then, throughout the evening, things started to happen. First, the air conditioning broke down. 
which was very unpleasant in the midsummer heat. Then the toilet got clogged and flooded. Then the heaters broke, which was also very unpleasant because the night was going to be a very cold one. I remember an Indian man knocking on our door each time something broke, just to complain. As our misfortune kept piling up, I remember talking to various people about it. One time I spoke to a man with a small daughter who spent the entire evening doing small dances in the hallway. She would run past our compartment and giggle, which was honestly a bit spooky, but also kind of sweet, you know, the way children are. I also spoke to the train conductor, who was a fat little man with a moustache. He looked as if he had stepped right off the pages of some old-timey book. I mentioned meeting these people, because I want you to know that we were not alone on that train. I am certain of that. As almost everything except the lines had broken down in our carriage, Victor suggested that we might go to the bar. The bar on the train was, ironically enough, in carriage one. So we would have to go through the entire train just to get there. But we were all getting quite bored with our little compartment, so we agreed to join Victor. The first thing that I noticed was the darkness. Not in the hallway, which was lit as usual, but in the compartments. The way it worked was that when a compartment was left empty, without any people sleeping there, the lights would be off and the door would be open. And when the door to the carriage was open, you could see the blue light night that lit up the small room slightly. And that was all I could see in the carriage. Open doors and empty compartments. As we walked past them, I looked into each and every one of the carriages and I saw only that blue light night illuminating empty spaces. Carriage 84, carriage 83, carriage 82. All compartments were empty. Carriage 81, carriage 88, carriage 80, carriage 79, empty. So on, and so on. The others noticed it too. Victor jokingly mentioned that with so many empty spaces in the train, we could all pick our own carriage to sleep in. After all, there was no need to be crammed up in one single compartment as we were in carriage 85. He said, Why place all your travellers in one single compartment or at the very end of the train? After all, it did not seem like there was anyone else on the train with us. And that bothered me. Because I knew, I knew that we had not been alone. Where was everyone? Where were all the families that we saw at the train station in Venice who were also set to travel to Paris? I noted to myself that perhaps people had just been moved to a different carriage due to the toilet breaking down. It would be logical. There was no need to panic. But this did not stop me, however, from checking still every single compartment we passed. I looked through every window, through every door opening, and all I saw was an empty darkness and that blue night light. No door was closed, no curtains were drawn, every bed and every chair that we passed was empty. It seemed as if we were the only four people that existed in that singular moment in time. When I talked to Lana about it, she mentioned that she had done the exact same thing as I had at the time. She had also checked every single compartment in every carriage, looking into every bed, every chair, and saw that they were all empty. Lana thought that perhaps we had gone into a different reality, a different dimension. She had read about it before, about people, getting stuck in a place different than our own reality. But I did not want to give in to superstition that quickly. I may be a bit of an anxious person, but I'm also a very rational one, so I tried to reason with myself. There had been three stops since our departure from Venice, Metro, yet Padova, Vicenza and Verona. I'm a big fan of Shakespeare, so our last stop at Verona I could remember very well. 
But since then, the swaying of the train had been a constant in our journey. No other stops had been made. And even if people had left the train at those stations, there still would have been plenty of people left traveling to the bigger cities. Milan, Dijon, Paris. So I figured that maybe we were just not the only ones with the idea to go to the bar. There should be plenty of people there. So when Victor opened the door leading to the bar, I expected it to be busy. I expected to see at least one or two families, but it was empty. The bar was empty except for the bartender. The moment I saw him standing there, blankly staring into space as every service employee does from time to time, I felt a bit of relief. When ordering, the bartender did not look us in the eye once. He looked at none of us, he just blankly stared into that same spot of space. It was as if he did not even see that we were there. We did leave that bar as quickly as possible. The relaxed vibe that had been there from the beginning of our journey had completely vanished. When walking back, we all walked in silence. Once again, I checked every compartment as we passed it. Empty. Everything was empty. All I saw was that blue light light that filled the darkness and the emptiness of the compartments we passed. When we got back to carriage 85, everyone was still silent. Without saying a word, we all went to bed. The next thing I remember is being woken up by the train conductor, knocking on our door with our breakfast. Arriving in Paris the next morning, I saw how many people exited the train with us. Families I had seen at the station were dragging their massive bags out of the small doors. I don't know what happened that night. Whatever it was, it was certainly strange. That was my own experience. Um, it is just something that stuck with me and I still do talk about it with my friend who also experienced this, who I named Lana in this story. And um, we just, we don't know what happened. That's the thing. Um, there are instances in your life that you can be like, oh, I'm like, this is a haunting or a, or a demon or something. And this is just this was just an instance where I was like I don't I don't know what's going on here. And it was only later when my friend told me like oh I think that we went into a different dimension that I was like well I gotta I gotta look up some things. And when I read other people's experiences online, it felt very similar. And it, and it uh, also struck me that a lot of these experiences happen at night. And of course, you can say uh, it has to do something with um, sleep paralysis or um, how do you call it like when you're very exhausted we had been traveling for eight days when we experienced this and we had slept in uh, several night trains and also a few hostels and those aren't great but i wasn't particularly tired at that time uh, i actually sleep quite all right when i'm traveling so i wasn't tired and even if I had been hallucinating all of this, it wouldn't explain how the others experienced it that well. So my friend, also Victor. I actually didn't talk about it uh, with the other Italian because he simply did not speak English and Victor did not feel like playing translator. So he was just very silent. Uh, I'm actually very curious what they think about this experience. I have no way of finding them back. I still do remember uh, Victor's uh, last name, but um, I don't think that I will ever be able to like find him online. Maybe, maybe I should try to find him and ask him about this instance. Maybe he doesn't remember it at all. But yeah, I think everyone experiences once in their life, at least once, uh, basically a glitch in the matrix, something that you see that you cannot quite explain, that seems a bit off. Uh, all of these reddit posts, by the way, I did find on the r slash glitch in the matrix uh, subreddit. But yes, I, I'm curious, first of all, your thoughts about this phenomena. What do you think could have happened uh, either to me or to one of the other people? And I'm also very curious, just overall, what did you think about the format of this episode? 
whether you like the format of me reading Reddit posts. So yeah, I'm I'm very curious what you think about this format. Of course, I'm, I'm, the next episode is just just going to be as I've always done. But if you did like this format, maybe I will do some more similar to this in the future. Um, but only if you like it. Um, you can always message me on social media. Just just hop into my DMs and tell me that you love or hate me. I don't. I don't. I. I yeah. Please don't hate me. But uh, the Instagram is certainly strange, the podcast. So yeah, um, thank you for listening to Certainly Strange. If you like this podcast, please consider leaving a review on Spotify. That would be really helpful. Uh, Also, tell your friends and tell your family about this podcast. That's just the best way of supporting it. Everything about this podcast can be found on the website certainlystrange.com. There you can also find the transcript of this episode. And once again, thank you for listening. Bye.